All right, Nick, uh, do you want to stop recording and hit it again and I'll uh, intro? I will do that, yeah. All right, welcome to the Wild Farm Family Fun Show. We have a uh, special episode for you guys today. And uh, so if you're just joining us for the first time on the show, or if you're listening in through the podcast version, uh, this show is all about farm, family, food, and most importantly, fun. Uh, we always bring in some awesome, interesting guests across all walks of life within those areas. We dig into their stories, their expertise, uh, hopefully providing value to you. And then we end the show always with Chef Nick in the kitchen. He's usually got some type of dish re uh, prepared up for you with a recipe to share as well. And so I know uh, today he's got a, a list of recipes uh, to provide to you following our, our guest interview today. Um, Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Troy, and I'm, I'm super thrilled and honored to be uh on this special episode with you and, and Joel here. And uh, I, I cannot wait to dive into the story and um, expertise that Joel is um, bringing to this show and, and more importantly into the world as it relates to, you know, us as being, you know, the land um, and, how it impacts our food and our families and everything. So I'm, I'm just super thrilled and I can't wait to learn um, what Joel has to uh, share with us today. So I'm doing great and Joel is com coming in from Virginia. And so Joel, why don't we bring you on up? How are you doing today? And uh, what is a fun fact that you uh, might wanna just share with us just to kind of ice break this open? Oh, well, it's great to be with you. It's a real honor. And um, uh, it's a good day to be on here. It's kind of rainy and drizzly today. So it's nice to not feel guilty about being in at the desk doing a podcast. That's always <laughs> a, a bit of a bit of a treat, you know, uh, we, we, we farmers, you know, day, daylight is precious and especially this time of year in the spring. Uh, nice, you know, sunny, warm, pretty days are especially valuable uh, to be outside. So, um, so it's been, a, it's been, a, we, we've had this uh, nice warm rain and uh, the grass I think is already perked up. Uh, we're going to, we're going to see some pretty big changes between now and the end of next week. Uh, fun fact, a fun fact. Uh, did you know that uh, Americans spend $8 billion a month on pet food? Mm. Wow. <laughs> Well, that's good for the pet food industry. <laughs> is, is that not amazing? Uh, you know, we a uh, couple couple of years ago we hooked up with some uh, some pet food uh, a pet food outfit called uh, Farmhounds down in Atlanta, Georgia, hmm. and they take our chicken backs and necks and heads and feet, turn them into uh, doggy treats that we then sell. They they actually um, they actually maintain a chain of custody through the vendor. So the little baggies of it that we have have, you know, it's from Polyface on the bag. That's their marketing strategy. They use, you know, they use branded farms to sell it to their customers. It's a, it's a fabulous uh, marketing strategy. And, um, and uh, uh, what we've, what we've learned is the people tend to be willing to spend a lot more on their pets than on their kids when it comes to, uh, when it comes to nutrition. Um. <laughs> Yes, yes. And that's not, and you know, it's sad to contrast that with Joel is that I believe I've learned at one point, a lot of your big uh, dog food chains are purchased by companies like Mars, like the chocolate brand yeah. candy companies. And so um, right. just to kind of yeah. interesting correlate that between poor nutrition with your kids and, and dog food. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely a big market. And that's why a lot of companies are buying uh, dog food uh, companies too. So fascinating well i have to say i'm probably one of those guilty people who uh are are spending into that eight billion dollars i think my dog eats uh just as well as i do so <laughs> yeah well i mean well we we, we do too i mean uh, it, this is not this is not a disparagement against pets but it you know it, it is a you know i think it's just interesting um it's just interesting to show the the magnitude when people say, "Oh, you know, I can't, I can't afford, you know, I can't afford decent food and things." Uh, a lot of times, you know, um, they're dropping, they're dropping uh, 
hundred, two hundred dollars a month, which uh, for a for a farmer like us, if that were if that were if that little percentage, extra percentage, were dropped into the actual human food part, uh, suddenly they could eat they could eat like royalty. They could eat like really authentic, integrity, honest, honest food, um, and and uh, everybody would be healthier and happier. But uh, I mean, sure, I like I like dogs and cats as well as anybody. Uh, not so much snakes. Snakes are that's uh, a little bit too far for me, but. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, what we know about snakes is they don't really care about us either, right? Um, so <laughs> I think I think we're okay. I think we're okay with that. <laughs> um, well, that's good. So let's dig in. And I know um, Nick. So just for our listeners um, that may uh, are curious a little bit more about your work, so so Joel Salatin, uh, owner or co-owner of uh, Polyface Farms is also uh, an editor and a blogger uh, of a popular site. Um, and then is really, uh, I would say, renowned or worldly known in regenerative farming, where from what I discovered in your work, um, there are people that flock from all across the country to learn about what you do on your farm and what we would call in a simple way, maybe as a natural cycles process of a farm, right? Where you build the entire ecology into farming. And so, we're really blessed with this episode today because we're going to dig into Joel, but Joel's story, but we're also going to dig into what does that mean and how does that operate and what you can do as a listener and whether you own a farm, whether you operate a garden or anything in your backyard, but we all should put attention into the care of the soil uh, of where our food comes from, in addition to supporting those uh, in our community that grow it for us. Um, and so I just wanted to provide that lens, but Joel, tell us a little bit about you. Like, how did this get started for you? Well, um, so our family came to this place here in Virginia, Shenandoah Valley. We're just outside of Stanton off of uh, Interstate 81, which is kind of the main uh, north-south corridor in the western part of Virginia. And uh, we came to the farm in 1961 when I was just four years old. Uh, Dad was an accountant. Mom was a school teacher. And um, Dad had been in Venezuela, South Carolina, Venezuela, South Carolina, Venezuela, South America for, uh, for uh, uh, 12 years and, um, and had purchased a piece of land down there, a thousand acre farm. And was, uh, the goal was to raise uh, broilers, uh, broiler chickens and dairy down there. And um, had these two, you know, two sons coming on, my older brother's three years older than I. And um, we were there farming and, and coming right along uh, and then we got caught in uh, the 1959 uh, junta, junta of uh, Perez Jimenez, and um, basically the machines came in, machine guns came in the front door as we fled the back door, and we lost everything, and uh, stayed for about six to eight, eight more months trying to get protection, trying to stay, and every door closed. So um, Easter Sunday, 1961, we arrived back on a merchant marine ship in Philadelphia, and um, and looked at farms from. Uh, kind of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, down into Shenandoah Valley, down to Raleigh, North Carolina. Dad wanted to be one day away from D.C., from the Venezuelan embassy, in case things eased up and we could go back. Well, that never happened, uh, but it, it did keep us from going back to where mom and dad were from out in the Midwest, in Indiana and Ohio. So we found this uh, worn-out rock pile of gullies here. It was absolutely the, you know, the worst piece of land, but it was cheap. And so, uh, so started over and of course, you know, 10 to 12 years, every dime from the off town, you know, from the accounting and the school teaching paycheck went to the mortgage. So that by the time I was in my teens, the land was paid off. We were out of debt. The land was paid off. It was a great place to grow up. Dad was a visionary way ahead of his time. Um, got into this uh, red Andre Voisin stuff, uh, invented an electric, uh, a portable electric fencing system. I realized the value of mobile mobile infrastructure rather than stationary infrastructure, uh, perenni perennials rather than annuals, <clears throat> and, um, and and the whole carbon the carbon economy. We we purchased a chipper so we could do composting, and uh, mm -hmm. so by the time I hit my mid teens, um, I was in love with this place, and I was already at that point beginning to see some of the gall. We planted we planted about sixty acres in trees. For for um, you know for re, uh, conservation, um, we we uh, you know we were seeing some some develop some progress in the 
in the fertility. And, um, and I, I just, you know, I was just in love with it and wanted to make this a career. And, uh, and so dad and I had a conversation. I was about I don't know, 17 or so. And remember, he was an accountant and he had a, he had an, a client that was a realtor. And this realtor just off the cuff one day said, well, Bill, you know, your farm's worth, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, uh, you ever think about selling, you know, well, well, you know, it had doubled in, in uh, whatever, 10 years, it had doubled in value. And dad was, wow, you know, always ready to do the new thing. He said, well, well, we could sell this and buy, you know, three times the acreage in Missouri or Arkansas or something, always ready to go, you know, do the new thing. And I got wind of it and uh, we, had a, we had a conversation out um, out on the farm lane one morning and he said um, he said you really want this for your career and I said absolutely and uh, he I'll never forget he said he said I will never I'll never mention selling I'll never mention changing again this is here for your launch pad and mm -hmm. so while it was it was not a it was not a going concern at that time it never made money it was not a real business um, when Teresa and I got married in 1980 um, it, it was it was it was here ready to do something with and so um so i i had had my chicken since i was 10 years old i peddled eggs in the community and and had my spending money that was my project throughout my teen years sold on the curb market had a garden we milked a couple cows we always had a couple pigs and uh at the curb market which was a precursor to today's farmers markets yes. we were able to 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 uh, milk cows we made uh, cottage cheese and yogurt and uh, of course we could sell buttermilk we could we could uh, um, dress chickens and sell them eggs uh, produce and um, so I cut my teeth as a teen uh, not playing football or basketball but up every Saturday every Saturday morning of the year at four o'clock to be down at the curb market at six to sell mm -hmm. our stuff. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't exchange that experience for a million dollars. And uh, it made me love people. It made me love branding. It made me love marketing. And it made me extremely, um, uh, uh, it made me a listener. It made me a listener to what the market wanted and what the market needed. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, you know, Teresa and I got married and, and we, we started, started in and I worked in, I worked in town as a news reporter for a couple of years, it took us about two and a half years living in the attic of the farmhouse. Uh, if we didn't grow it, we didn't eat it. We lived, we drove a $50 car um, and we didn't have a television. We still don't have a television. And, um, and so we, you know, we devoted ourselves to this dream and it took us two and a half years to put together enough nest egg that we could live for one year. Mm. I had him my two week notice, September 24, 1982, walked out of that newspaper office. I fully expected to go to go back to something, you know, that we'd run through it in a year. But as it turned out, we never did. It was tight, but, um, but, but by being here, we were here for every calf that was born, every time the green beads needed to be weeded, you know, and the slippage, we were able to reduce the slippage and uh, able to eat through. It took us about three or four years to finally re look at each other and say, huh, I think we're going to make it. You know, I think we're going to make it. And, uh, and now it's, you know, it's, uh, well, I think last year we, we took in uh, three and a half million. Uh, there are two, you know, 20, we, we, su we supply 20, uh, 20, 20 salaries from the uh, farm and we service, you know, uh, 5,000 customers. We ship nationwide and service you know, institutions, um, restaurants, the few that are still in business and, um, and have a farm store and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a platform to germinate new young farmers. It's probably some of our most exciting uh, work now is launching, you know, launching new young farmers. Yes. Oh, so, so a lot to unpack in there. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with um, the, the thought process. So you went from your dad being a visionary, right? And I would imagine a piece of that rubbed off on you because everything that you just talked through was basically foundational level of learning how a farm works to building a passion for it, to telling your dad, basically, I want this to be me. I want this. I want to live this journey, dad. Right. So 
-hmm. And then from there, you went through the challenges of figuring out what you're going to do, but then building an empire, right, per se, to where it is now. And so uh, there are a lot of farms that we work with that are, and, and I'm sure you do too, Joel, that are very small to mid-sized that they go through this struggle where they're, they're potentially a hobby farmer or they're trying to farm, but they're trying to juggle between work, uh, additional jobs, and then farming at the same time. So what in there can you kind of share with them about how you kind of built that journey through? Because I would imagine, like you said, there were some tough times in there that you had to make a decision or it was, you know, really tight, but you knew what you wanted to do. And so what could you offer them um, yeah. from that perspective? Sure, Troy, that's a, such a, it's such a foundational question. Um, so, so a, a couple things. One is to, um, to, to don't be afraid to accumulate a little bit of a nest egg to give you some capital wiggle room. So many, pl are, so many places are, are capital struggle for every penny is just a struggle. And so sometimes it's, uh, don't, don't feel guilty. Don't, don't worry about, look, if you got to, if you got to supplement a little bit with some off farm income, do it. Don't that, don't be ashamed about that. In fact, um, the first three or four or five years that we were uh, struggling, um, I did I did a couple things just for cash. Um, like we we had a guy that uh, that that was planting some trees, and um, for about three years I helped him plant these couple of properties and trees. And uh, you know it it wasn't much, but you know it was a thousand dollars. I'd help him. Oh, you know, uh, um, ten. You know, 10 mornings in a, in, in a spring. And um, it might've only been a thousand dollars, but when you're living on $300 a month, a thousand dollars cash is a nice little, you know, infusion yes. to keep you going. Uh, another guy, I got wind, a friend, uh, he needed, he wanted to build a fence, a boundary fence along a, a, a wooded edge. And the fence company, of course, they were going to cut down the trees. So they could get in there with their big equipment and stuff. I looked at it and said, you know, I think I could, I could, I could, I could dig these holes by hand and put this fence in. Won't cut all the trees. I might cut one or two, but I think, I think I could do this. I beat the, I beat the big fencing company by about twenty percent in price, and again, you know, made a uh, thousand bucks. So, so don't be afraid to supplement yourself. Don't be too proud to a do anything, uh, and 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 then and then you know, be willing to, to supplement, to circulate in the community. Um, that's one thing. The, the second thing uh, is, to, um, is to develop relationships from people who have things you can borrow or expertise you can utilize. <clears throat> Anything from plumbing expertise to electrical to mechanic. Um, uh, you know, we, we have just been blessed with, with expertise in the community. And, um, you know, you can give them a Thanksgiving turkey. You, yeah, I, I mean, th th this whole, this yes. whole relational thing is a, is a big deal. And um, uh, I've come to the conclusion it, it, today that what we really need is to turn in our 401k programs. And we need, to, we need to surround ourselves with community of people who know how to grow things, fix things, and build things. Yes. If you surround yourself with people who know how to grow things, build things, and fix things, you you're gonna you're gonna be the last guy standing, you know, when, yes. when things go to pot. And uh, I'm not you know I'm not a conspiratist or saying things are going to pot, but <laughs> we we do live in very unsettled times. We do live in unsettled times. Yes. And um, and and I think that um, that this is driving uh, literally a a tsunami of of self-reliance and do-it-yourselfism, uh, even indeed rural homesteading type uh, living. So, um, so yeah, uh, and, and then I would say an, another big thing is that you can't do it all. I meet so many young farm families. Well, how, how do we run this thing and get the kids in ballet and soccer and all that? I just look at them and say, don't, don't even try. You, you can't do it all. You've got to decide what you're going to do. And, uh, and, and running to town, running to town is one of the biggest leaks in uh, farms. Look, if you want to farm, farm. And if you can't, if your kids can't figure out, and if you and your family can't figure out 
an entertainment value in in uh, in going around a pond watching frogs and toads and and sitting on the back porch listening to spring peepers and building a little uh, campfire in the back and roasting hot dogs. Um, you know, a, 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 what I call commas in life, uh, commas in the in the hurried, hectic frenzy of life. A little comma does not have to be expensive. It can be as simple as as two hours of um, of of cooking hot dogs on a stick and a, and a fire in the backyard. Yes. Um, and, and, and those kinds of things are, are, that's what we do in the country. You know, we, we, we're here because we love it. And so, um, so develop your own on-farm recreation entertainment, invite your friends, you know, uh, and, and have them come over and, um, and you become the nexus of a true authentic, um, uh, eco, uh, ecology entertainment style, and and that's that that'll that competes any day with soccer and, uh, and and I'm not opposed to don't read into this. I'm not I'm not opposed to any of that. I'm just saying that when we look when we look at leaks on struggling little, these are things that I see, yeah. uh, and these are these are um, these are these these are temptations and they're frustrations that I, that I hear from people. And, and I would say the, the final one, the final one would be, don't be so proud that you listen to what the market wants. I am convinced that one of our successes here is that we have never really gotten involved in exotics, you know, beef, pork, chicken, eggs, (laughs) you know, turkey, you know, it's, it's basic stuff. And, and uh, the reason I say this is because we have worked with numerous uh, produce, produce uh, craft farmers in the, over the years who, you know, jumped on our delivery to the restaurants. We collaborate, you know, in the delivery. And, uh, and the chefs, Nick, you'll appreciate this. The chefs are constantly telling us, look, I can only use about five pounds of, of $2 blue heirloom Peruvian potatoes a week. What I really need is I need I need a hundred pounds of really good, um, well-grown, compost-grown kinnebecks, or, or or something, right? And 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 a lot of these uh, uh, small craft producers have all this, you know, heirloom exotic stuff in their heads. And again, I'm not opposed to that, but my goodness, our chefs tell us all the time: I need fifty pounds of carrots. I need fifty pounds of just basic potatoes. They love to garnish it with special little exotics. But, but as, a, as a small farmer, you, you start, start with where the market's easy. What's the market screaming for? Meet that need first, and then do your altruistic garnishes around the edges. And, and that's, that's an element that I see a lot of times too. Keep it simple. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's very, we know this, that language to people in communication, it can be very hard because if you're trying something new, a new idea, you have to figure out how to communicate it in a simple way. And if you can't figure that out, then what do you have? You just have a cool idea. So I think that's, that's a great uh, insight or advice because to get started in something and build a foundation, you do need to keep it simple in a way that your customers understand. Yeah, and and just on top of what you said about, you know, restaurants demand and and everything, Joel, like even, um, I think that's 100% correct. It's like, just give me, we need the basics and then to garnish it, right? Like food costs, um, Mm -hmm. that's the number one thing that drives restaurants out of business is that their menus are out of alignment with their food costs. And so if you can keep it simple, like, garnish it with the more exotic things as opposed to making those like heirloom blue potatoes, like your main dish, um, that's going to carry you into your ability to keep your restaurant open. So I I appreciate that you actually support, you know, that concept as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, you know, people, there are a few things, there are a few things as, whatever routine as food i mean what people eat what people want to eat and so i mean i mean look i love lamb okay but the per capita consumption of lamb is 0.7 pounds 
per person per year in the U.S. 0.7 pounds. Uh, so you know, hey, I love sheep. I mean, yeah, but um, but just realize when you start marketing lamb, that pool that pool of of market is is tiny. You know, compared to chicken or beef or you know the, the main uh, the main line stuff. So um, so you know just and and you know pheasant. I mean, all the exotics are are great, but they're just extremely small markets. And I think that that uh, unless you have a real special circumstance, um, generally building foundation on what I call every man food, <laughs> uh, building your foundation on every man food is uh it, it broadens your market and then you can always dump in your you know your little specialty items as you go along yes that's very good okay so um i'd love to dig into regenerative farming and so you kind of alluded to this earlier where when you guys first started on the farm uh, with your dad that you guys started to build the ecology uh, and by ecology i mean the trees, like we're not just talking about the animals, the, the crops that you're growing, but what does your land look like? How many trees do you have? What does that foster as far as the soil fertility and everything? And so can you elaborate that a little bit for our listeners on why all of that matters when you're considering a farm and what maybe they could do to, to their own land or to help out in this space too? Sure, it's a great question. So in gen I, I start with this, with the answer for this, I start with it as a basic understanding that there are roughly three, three major ecosystems. One is um, open land, like fields. One is forest, woods, and the other is riparian, you know, a pond, swamp, you know, watery river, okay. So you, you've got your water, you got your trees, you got your grasses, okay. And obviously, you know, silvo pasture, and there, you know, there, there are obviously, uh, you know, subsets of of kind of these. But but these are the three great environments. And so, on the farm, what we want is to um, is to create a mosaic, so that we have as much edge, as much mosaic edge as possible, where these three environments intersect. The reason is because very, very few plants and animals thrive in only one of those. Most animals, especially, and plants too, like a little bit of both. And that's why game biologists talk about edge effect, because edge effect, where you've got these two environments coming together, is where you have this you know, proliferation. So I'm, I'll give you an example. Wild turkeys, for example. Wild turkeys, uh, their little turkey poults need about 28% protein. Well, you can't find 28% protein in a forest. You just, 28% protein comes from bugs, you know, insect, grasshoppers, crickets, things yes. like that. And you don't find very much of that in a forest. You find it in a field, uh, you know, in a pasture, especially. And so, um, and, and, but, but, the, but the, the turkeys don't, they don't like to live in the field because they're vulnerable there. A coyote can find them or, or something. Okay. So they want the woods to live in for protection and roost in, but they want the field to eat in. And, and so that's a perfect example of the kind of, of edge I'm talking about. And then what happens is as you, as you create these edges, you reduce airflow, you break up the wind currents, you actually create different hydrology patterns because trees on a hillside act as water pumps mm -hmm. to bring water from low ground up to high ground. So there are all sorts of neat uh, big ecological principles that happen uh, when you start building these. So, so we've built, I don't know what, 15 ponds here. Uh, we fence out all the rivers and, and streams and the riparian areas. We fence out the woodlots so that we can grow a lot of uh, moles and voles and chipmunks um, that can feed the carnivorous predators so they don't mess with our chickens. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so that whole uh, balanced ecology comes with this very, very diversified mosaic of landscape pattern. I love it. Okay. So from, from a, um, let, let's kind of break it down to like, so let's say I live in a, I don't have, own a farm and I live on a land that I would love to kind of give back to, right? I will understand that maybe the soil isn't what it should be, but I do understand that I need to give that back to not only my family, but, you know, to the environment. 
Are there anything that you can kind of teach us as to somebody that not only supports farms that do this, but they can actually do something themselves at home around helping put that back into the ecology or into the environment that we live in? Uh, are you, you, you talking about farms or are you talking about uh, not non-farmers trying to trying to put into that ecology? Nine farmers at this point. I just, I'm trying to uh, see if we not, can get consumers to think a little bit more cautiously, yeah. consciously on environmental. Sure, stuff. sure. Well, uh, yeah, a, a couple things I would say. A number, the first thing is to patronize, to patronize a farmer that is building soil, that, that is, you know, uh, creating better water. Um, yes. Uh, and, and so uh, how do you know that you're patronizing somebody like that? Well, you can learn a lot off of websites. And then of course uh, you can turn off Netflix and go for a ride <laughs> and uh, go visit, go visit a couple of these. And, uh, yeah. and you know, vet, look, vetting, vetting vendors, vetting food purveyors is a skill just like any other. And whereas right now you may feel completely intimidated. Well, I don't, I don't know what I'm looking for, you know, Believe me, after you visit half a dozen farms and talk to some, you'll start to, you'll start to hear threads. You'll, you know, and you'll start to, where's your compost pile? Uh, you know, where, you know, you'll start, you'll start yeah. looking for things um, that, are, that are like you know, benchmarks of excellence uh, that, that you're looking for. Uh, you know, like for pastured poultry, uh, you know, where, uh, sh show, show me the, the move spot. Uh, we call it the, uh, the jet stream, you know, where, <clears throat> Where, where they, you know, they've been and they're moving along. So to tell tell signs. So number one is that you can patronize really good authentic uh, uh, integrity farmers. Uh, number two, <clears throat> another good thing is to buy as unprocessed as possible. Yes. When, when you buy highly processed, um, A, you have way more packaging because he had more waste to deal with. But number two, you give, you, you essentially um, give somebody else the right to mess with your food. And, um, and so we are big believers in domestic culinary excellence. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you use your kitchen to prepare, package, process, and preserve the four Ps, prepare, package, process, and, and preserve foods, um, uh, we, we can, I don't know what, 800 quarts of stuff a summer. I mean, that's just what we do. You know, when, when Teresa sends me shopping, I don't go to the store. She gives me a list. I go to the basement and I bring up, you know, four quarts of, you know, quarter of tomato, tomato juice, a quarter of green beans, uh, homemade applesauce, you know, and yes. that's just the way we shop. Okay. Yes. And, and you know what? The only thing that has to be thrown away there is a little itty bitty lid you know, lid on that on that canning jar, um, the glass you can use again, and all that. So so um, so buy unprocessed, and that is also a way to make sure that that a farmer gets the largest portion of the retail dollar, rather than a whole bunch of of, of middle people. And then I would say the third thing is to um, to to just do something yourself, even if it's nothing more than an under sink vermicomposting bin. You can get little kits, a little vermicomposting bin put under your sink. Uh, you, can, you, can get a, you can get these, the, the, urban, the urban growing uh, infrastructure now is quite profound. I mean, special pots, special hanging, hanging PVC pipes with, with little cups in them. You, know, you can hang on your porch, have your little herb, fresh herb garden hanging on your porch, uh, honeybees on the roof. Uh, I mean, there, there, are, there are lots and lots of things that you can do, uh, you know, hanging a, hanging a, a window uh, a thing outside your window on the south exposure, uh, building a solarium on your house so you can grow, uh, you know, winter, you know, brassicas and, and, and lettuces um, in, a, in a northern climate. But this whole thing is about just do something for yourself, no matter how small it is, so that you actually viscerally participate in the awesomeness and mystery of, of, of life. Yes. And if there's, if there's one thing that will humble you, it is that. You, you quickly learn, wow, this is not about me. It, it's a much bigger thing than me. And, and, and I think that that is a powerful 
life lesson to just come to the day with to appreciate this is bigger than me. Yes. Yeah. And one thing that my wife and I always wanted to stick to is we made sure that our kids understand because if we're out there doing those small things, like you're mentioning, Joel, then that means that our kids are paying attention. That means that our kids care about the food that they put in their body. They're right. watching me compost the garden. Like mm -hmm. it's just, it's the small things that help them realize that. Otherwise they fall into the traps for which big businesses or grocery stores or markets create, which is the convenience of food that is right there next to them, highly processed and sugary foods, which we know leads to addictions and things like that. And so it takes just something small in your house to start to build that educational awareness foundation. Right, well said. <clears throat> Nick, did you have any questions? I do have a question, uh, Joel. Thank you so much for, you know, just, you know, sharing about the history of, 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 of your farming experience and your dedication to, you know, regenerative farming and, and you know, your commitment to, um, you know, bringing that level of, of excellence uh, of food and your product and your farming into consumers and restaurants. Um, I'm, I'm curious um, why why should we as a consumer, me, myself included in this, should we care so much about like regenerative, regenerative farming? Like what is at stake um, as far as like the global impact here, right? Like I, I'm, I'm been reading this book um, by Mark Hyman and he in the book uh, just briefly mentions it, but he's like, we only, According to like, I don't remember what the source was, but he said that we have maybe like 60 harvests left in the entire world. Like, and so I'm just curious how, why this regenerative farming um, is so important for like the future of, of humanity. Yeah, well, uh, well, the, the trajectory, you know, the trajectory is not good. Now, I, I don't, I, I'm way too optimistic to ascribe to this doomsday uh, scenario that I hear people saying, but I do ascribe to the Chinese proverb that if we keep going the way we're going, we're going to end up where we're headed. And, and you know, whether it's 60 harvests or 600 harvests, um, uh, who wants that for our future, right? And so the fact is that our trajectory is a is a declining trajectory. The poll we're we're losing pollinators. We're losing insect biodiversity. We're losing amphibians. We're losing arable land, aquifers. Uh, we're we're seeing increased desertification. Every bushel of corn costs us a bushel of soil. Um, you know we're losing we're losing soil at the rate of uh, of about. Well, it, it takes about a thousand years to grow an inch naturally, and we're losing it at the rate of about an inch every, uh, you know, 30, 40 years. So while, while you know, you, you can't, the, the problem is in one lifetime, it's really hard to look out across there and say, well, we've lost an inch of soil. Uh, and so then that generation dies and another generation starts over, you know, it, it, it's hard to appreciate that. But we do have now ways, you know, of measuring and um, and it it the the trajectory the trajectory is not good. Potable water potable water is way down. And of course we're you know we're uh, I don't want to get in a big discussion about climate change, but I can tell you that the the arid areas of the world are getting drier rapidly, and the wet areas of the world are getting wet wetter rapidly. And the reason that's happening is because um, because the Earth is trying to cool itself and maintain a you know the, the physics. The physics of balance here and so since the since the arid areas are being overgrazed and over tilled there isn't the uh the bacterial exudes from the vegetation and because water needs water needs bacteria in order to condense on and um i mean this is a microscopic particle but uh it's the condensation the, the, the problem is the greenhouse gas thing is a is a is a, is a ancillary thing only about five percent of the planetary warming and cooling is greenhouse gases 95 percent is water condensation making clouds and 
And the problem is when you don't have vegetation exuding bacteria from the leaf exfoliates into the atmosphere, you don't have condensation. And so, so um, that's why the drier areas are getting drier and the wetter areas are getting wetter. So we're getting desertification and massive flooding you know, all at the same time. And um, I don't want to go on and beat the, beat the answer too long, but, but, but the point is that we, we are not being friendly to our, to our, our planetary nest. And if, if you look, you know, I love Elon Musk. The future is not going to be on Mars. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, the future is not going to be on Mars. If we don't figure out how to live in harmony with our own nest, we're not going to escape to another one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we, we desperately need to figure out how to feed ourselves and grow soil, how to uh, create abundance and have more water uh all of that has to be and, and the beauty is we know how to do this this is not this is not impossible to do we we now know how to do this um we just we just need to we just need to get at it and, and so so the fact is that where we are is a physical manifestation of of quadrillions and quadrillions of little individual decisions you know do i go on the caribbean cruise or do I stay home and uh, and can all the the pre-frosted tomatoes that are coming in this week? Uh, you know, little decisions like that, uh, magnified by the quadrillions over time, that produces the world that we have, and the world that our grandchildren will inherit. Whatever that world is, that world is going to be a manifestation of the quadrillions of decisions that we make between now and our grandchildren's inheritance. And so um, if, if we want a different legacy, we've got to do a different thing. And, um, and so to me, it's a, very, it's a very simple thing. How can I personally, how can I personally um, touch an abundant legacy for my grandchildren? There's an MIT professor who just did a fascinating interview and um, he said, he said that in all of his, all of his, he's one of these uh, futuristic guys, what's going on in the future. And he said, uh, he said that one of the things that I've found, every single person, conservative, liberal, greeny, non-greeny, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. He said, there are three things that everybody seems to agree on right now in, in every, uh, every place. One is that we're not going a good direction and we hit a wall in 2020. The second thing is I want to help. And the third thing is I don't know how. Mm, yes. Wow. And, and I think I think that those of us farmers who have our hands in the soil, calluses on our hands, and who are who are showing the way to actually have abundance and build soil and sequester carbon and produce more biomass, those of us who are doing that. We, in fact, the MIT professor said farms are going to be the nexus of tomorrow's information, social networking, and, and practical outworking of how we live in the future. And, um, you know, we, we've been the ugly stepchildren for a long, long time. And perhaps, perhaps the next 20 years will be the time when actually um, healing I mean, there are good farmers and bad farmers, okay? Uh, but when, when the good farmers and the healing farmers actually, um, actually, you know, move into nobility, that'll be an exciting time. And one thing that I, I, I heard you say in there too is the educational system needs some changing because uh, where I'm at in particular, I don't know about Virginia or anything um, down south, but in Michigan, a lot of agricultural programs have been eliminated in high schools and middle schools. And we, I mean, based on what I just heard there from the professor and what you were just saying is that we need to do a better job at basically teaching everybody to be a farmer. Now, whether they go out and they do that as a professional career or not, or whether they buy land and they spend their entire life doing that, at least build the foundational level of what they should be doing in the world to protect uh, what we want to preserve, which is all of our own legacies. 
Sure, and and of course, then then you then you ask, well, what what you know, what kind of farming? And um, you know, you realize that, that 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 Bill Gates, you know, Bill Gates is now the largest farmland owner in the U.S. Um, but he is completely committed to genetically modified organisms, chemical yeah. fertilizers, monocrops, and artificial intelligence robotics uh, uh, running it. Uh, you realize there's a, you know, there, there are these, one, one school of thought is that, that, um, that biology is fundamentally mechanical. And the other is that biology is fundamentally, or, or that life, I, I, life, life is fundamentally mechanical or life is fundamentally biological. And, um, uh, Troy and Nick, I think that we're coming down on the side of life is fundamentally biological, not mechanical. Now, there's certainly there's certainly mechanical aspects to it, but it is fundamentally a, a biological thing. And the fact that you realize that 90 percent, get this, 90 percent of all of the living beings, organisms in the soil have yet to be named and cataloged. Yeah. We all, we've all we've only named and cataloged 10 percent of the soil biota and so now that we know how amazing and marvelous the human microbiome is i mean that's kind of the cutting edge now of 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 of, of human immunity uh, immunological function and all a uh, human wellness is this microbiome um we 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 now realize that that is that is a a, a kissing cousin to the soil microbiome i mean they're, they're they're identical in fact when you when you look at them under an electron microscope uh only only a phd can distinguish them i mean they, they look they look identical and so we we truly are we truly are um um you know soil manifest in human bodies we really are and so this idea that we're that you know that bill gates has where we're just gonna swashbuckle into this, uh, this mysterious, amazing, complex world of, of symbiosis and synergy and, 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 you know, and relational complexity with a, with a very simplistic um, approach for the, for the, to few, feed mankind in the future, uh, I think that's gonna implode and it's not going to work. And so I, I'm a big believer that there are, there, are, you know, th there are good farming techniques and there are destructive farming techniques, which obviously we have seen you know, uh, um, in our in our own country. Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, and uh, so I think you'd be curious in this. Um, there's a doctor out there called Stephen Cabral, and he writes a lot about the rain barrel effect, which is the environments that we live in. We don't understand what's harming us. Uh, in other words, when we don't live with the soil, uh, what we're left with is environmental toxins, whether that's metals. Uh, or pesticides or herbicides or whatever that is, whatever you want to call it, it surrounds the food that we eat. It surrounds uh, the water that we use, whether it's the drinking water or the water that we shower in. And then ultimately what we stock our cupboards with, like the packaging right. and everything. And so all of that is in and around our, our bodies and we don't understand what's even happening to us, but what we do understand is real. And what's real is the soil and nature. And if we spend our time with that, then we're more likely to prolong our, our longevity as human beings. That's, that's exactly right. The, the wealth of a nation, the wealth of a culture is tied up in the soil. Yes. Uh, Wall, Wall Street can come and, come and go, and I'm not an enemy of Wall Street. All I'm saying is, in, in the big scheme of things, I'd rather have soil than Wall Street. <laughs> and I think the average person would say the same thing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I love that analogy. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time today, Joel. Is there any last words that you want to share with our audience before we kick it over to Nick for some some recipes? Well, I, I would I would just say that the um, you know the encouragement I think here is that it's not a lost cause, and uh, and so we need to we need to just appreciate that we can come off the bleachers. We don't have to watch this game you know, uh, fail. <laughs> we, we, we can come off those bleachers. We can participate. We can get in the kitchen. We can get in the garden. We can get on the farm and, and, and in whatever capacity we have, whether it's simply buying right or growing right or thinking right, um, we, we, can, we can participate. We don't have to sit on the sidelines. We don't have to be the victims of somebody else's agenda. 
and we don't have to be dependent on 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 bad guys. Uh, we we can depend on good guys, and we can we can encircle ourselves. We can immerse ourselves with um, you know with good guys, and that's a you know that, that's a that's a a, a a fundamentally hopeful um, you know hopeful message. And I hope folks will realize that that um, there's a, there's a lot that we can do. Uh, that we're a long we're a long way from defeated. Just buck up and let's um, and let's let's change this legacy for the better. Mm. Right. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Joel. Um, we always invite our guests to stick around if you'd like. We we typically do cooking in the kitchen, so Nick uh, usually whips up a nice recipe in front of everybody and talks us through the proper ways to cut it, the proper ways to cook it, the proper seasonings, mixes, savories, and all that. Um, this time, he's more than likely just going to show some uh, recipes, but we always invite our guests to stick around, so we'd love for you to stick around if you have time. Thank you. Uh, we've got another, uh, what, 10, 10, 15 minutes? Yep. Good. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll watch what Nick's doing. I love, <laughs> to watch, right. I'll, I love to watch Wizards in the Kitchen. <laughs> well, he's got some interesting tips. At least I've, I've learned a few things to, to even teach our kids uh, in the kitchen. So, Nick, what do you have for us today? Yes. Um, well, I is, thank you so much, Joel, for um, just really opening um, – opening up my level of awareness um, just with everything, farming, everything, like being a global citizen. And um, I just, it was what you said about how can we train each other? Like, how can we train ourselves to think like farmers was like, like, I think that that was just, uh, that's something I'm gonna chew on for a little while. And uh, I'm just really grateful um, just as a chef uh, who gets to, um, work um, with the creations of, of what the farmers are doing and even I have a better job of vetting vendors and uh, I think that that is such a, a wonderful opportunity that I have and that everyone has to really understand um, and have that awareness of, of where that food is coming from and, and to have that connection um, with their farmer. So um, with that being said, one of the things I was going to do is um, because we're, um, we are in a, uh, a unique situation, I'm going to show a video um, that I have that I've created um, that kind of really touches on um, kind of what we we're talking about a little bit around chicken. And uh, what I'm going to do is also, um, it's going to be a, a video from my course that I created. Um, and I'm just pulling it up right now. Um, but it's, uh, it's going to be me in the kitchen, but not live. We'll just say that. So, um, so here's what I'm going to show you. It's, it's a recipe that we've done. But um, give me one second as I, as I pull it up. Um, and um, let's see. All right, so this is called, um, you know, again, this is, this is something that I come up with called the wild chicken salad and um, it's about five minutes long, um, but yes, I'm gonna just show that. I'm gonna share my screen here through Zoom, and we're gonna use that as my, uh, as my introductory for the kitchen for today's episode, and I'll share this recipe with everyone, along with um, a couple other recipes, because I do a big fan of chicken, and I might even throw in a little bit of a, uh, I've been working on a, uh, a, a couple dog recipes, so what you shared with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning, Joel, could be really good here. So give me one second as I uh, share the screen. And um, so here we go. We're going to talk about the wild chicken salad. Now 
we're going to make the wild chicken salad. This is maybe one of my most favorite go-to meals that I have created in my life. I like to take it with me in the mornings when I have to uh, go out for an early meeting. Uh, it's great for lunches. I snuck it into the movie theater. And I've even taken the meal on flights in a little storage container just because I love it so much. And now you're going to be able to master this recipe just as well as I have. So before we get going with assembling the wild chicken salad, we first need to cook the chicken. That is really important because we don't want to eat raw chicken. That's bad news. So <laughs> what we're going to do, the equipment we're going to want to start off with is we're going to have a sheet tray with some parchment paper. This is a, an efficiency step with the parchment paper because it saves on the cleaning process in the end. We need some olive oil, a little salt and pepper, garlic, and chicken. And then we're also going to use our little trusty meat thermometer because we want to make sure that our chicken is cooked to 165 degrees. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to line up my chicken on the, sh the parchment line sheet tray. Now watch this. Since this is the contaminated hand, I'm going to use my non-contaminated hand to take care of everything else. A little ambidextrous here. Maybe not as pretty, but saves me a trip to the to the hand washing station, but I will wash my hands as soon as I'm done with this. So I'm drizzling the chicken with a little olive oil and dusting it with some salt and pepper mixture. Then I'm also going to dust it with a little garlic powder, give her a little extra flavor. Okay, I like to hold it up high because it helps even out the seasoning. And I just want to for reference, give you a little glimpse at what I'm talking about. So I, as you can see, I have a nice spread of seasonings over the top of the chicken. And the next step is to pop this baby in the oven. We're going to roast it at about 400 degrees for roughly 15 minutes or until our internal meat thermometer says 165 degrees. So I'll pop this in the oven, wash my hands, wash your hands, and I'll see you back with some cooked chicken for the flow of the chicken salad. Wild Joy Chicken Salad. This may be one of the easiest and quickest and most delicious recipes we are making this course. It is great for on the go and often for me fills in as my meal for breakfast. So here's our haul. We have our chicken, our celery, our sliced grapes. We have some mayonnaise, our roasted pecans, and we got a little parsley to give it a little extra flavor at, at, at the end. So. Um, we're just going to start by just layering everything in to one single bowl. So that means everything, the whole haul is going in the bowl. Okay, then I'm going to just kind of eyeball some mayonnaise. I'm going to give it a mix. All right, we're all good and mixed up here. So now the magic part of the meal is you get to go ahead and dish it up, serve it up. And like I said, I sometimes eat this for breakfast. Uh, sometimes I'm on the go. So this might go directly into a cork container. And it's something that I might put together the night before just so that it is ready for me to go in the morning. So again, just kind of topping her off with a little extra seasoning because we can. So 
little finishing salt. And there you go. We have Wild Joy Chicken Salad, one of the quickest, most simplest, most delicious meals that we have in this course. Great for on the go, great for breakfast and lunch and maybe dinner too. <laughs> well, there you have it there, folks. <laughs> So Nick, uh, is this a beginning of the course program that people can access? So it'll be a lot of the things that we talk about on the show, but a little bit more adaptive and, and uh, intimate so they can kind of cook it along with you. Is that yeah. So that's a part of what, when you sign up for my, um, you know, for my cooking course, um, you actually just get, you get to be a part of, you get the course uh, as sort of like the foundations. It's sort of the textbook, but then, um, you know, with the price of the course, you also have access to, um, you know, bi-weekly live cooking classes with me, where we kind of dive in more to the consistency and the practice and the process of cooking and why that's important and bringing in information or, um, that I learn, like through people like Joel as to why it's really critical that we want to have that awareness to have those conversations, not just with ourselves, um, but with our families, like maybe even coming to the dinner table and say, hey, listen, like maybe instead of going on that cruise, we should go out to the farm and, you know, that we've been talking to and can a bunch of tomatoes for this upcoming winter, that kind of thing, right? So yep. those types of conversations are, 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 are the things that I try to encourage. I'm um, not to say anything against going on a cruise but you know as Joel was sharing is just like those types of decisions compounded over time and collectively could have monumental changes um, on on the on our grandchildren right on the people who are going to inhabit this world who are have yet to be born so and uh, one other question too Nick just for our audience and you know for myself obviously with having four kids um, but Will your classes include um, like kick, uh, cu like cutting strategies? Like how do you cut something most efficiently? Uh, because I know I'd mentioned to you that we got um, our uh, five-year-old Trevin a new uh, kitchen set so that he can cut his own stuff. And so he's been slinging some stuff in the kitchen, which we, we believe in teaching our kids uh, how to make everything and be a part of that, that journey in the kitchen. Um, and so is that part of your programs where kids can kind of learn to? Yes, it, the, the, the course is made for, for all ages. And, um, you know, what, so I sort of threw us in there to a recipe, but, you know, every time we're in the kitchen, we always walk through the basics for safety and efficiency. So always around how do you hold the knife? How do you set up your, um, your cutting board so it's not slipping, right? So we do cover those foundations, those basics, because one, we wanna make the kitchen fun, we wanna make it safe, and we wanna be efficient while we're in there. So yes, there's technique plus the fun and the excitement and the, and the fun of learning. So those pieces are definitely present, Troy. That's a great question. Excellent, excellent, Nick. Well, thank you for introing your uh, new course program. And I know that uh, the listeners that have followed you live in the kitchen uh, will probably enjoy that they can slow it down and do it with you versus trying to watch a video and pause it a bunch of times and, and come back to it. And so um, thank you for doing that. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Thank you, Joel, again. Uh, we're, we're truly grateful that you're able to join us for this time. Uh, lots of great insights. Um, if you just caught the end, we encourage you to go back and listen. Uh, lots of information around um, visionary, uh, starting as, as a kid, building something great, um, the ecology of a farm and why you should care and what the future really looks like and what does your life look like when it's touched uh, and, and mirrored up with the soil. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting things in there. So go back and check it out. This uh, special episode of the Wild Farm Family Fun Show. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you again, Joel. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Troy. That was great. Thank you. It makes makes me want it makes me want to eat it right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. All right. Bye, Joel. Thank you. Cool. Cool, ma'am. Good. How do you think that went? Good.
Good to get. So what I loved about that, and I think it's how we steered it, which is if you go and you search Polyface Farms and all that and everything, like his YouTube channel, he's got a ton of people that follow him, man. He's got a, he's like, like, I really like worldly famous. Like he's, there are people that are just across the world that, uh, and yes, he has a couple of articles out there that are a little deflammatory, um, but that's for him to, to, to figure out. Yeah. But I didn't want the episode to be about like his, uh, how to, how to debone a chicken right like he's he's out, he like does live videos about how to like <laughs> take chickens and how you take them apart and how you cultivate chickens around the land and all that and there's a lot of stuff out there he already does i really wanted to get into what makes joel and mm-hmm. then how he could basically share all that knowledge um of how he got started struggles successes and then his belief system around why people should really care about soil and i think we got there so yeah i i 100 i think you know, I think we've really got a great sense of who he is, you know, even that him sharing that conversation about with his father, like with at the farm, that was huge. Um, and then, um, yeah, like even him sharing, like, if this is you, like, here are those four principles that he was, if you're just getting started, like those were huge. And then I liked how it we got it to turn to you know, what is this, why is this important and what is really at stake here? Like, what's the, yeah. So I thought it was a really, he was very well, well-spoken and, and really had some really fascinating things to share. And even during it, it was like, it kind of just gave me the a feeling of affirmation that like what we're doing, you and I, Troy, is like, we're trying to bring the farm, like that type of education into like, maybe a little bit like, like you said, the agricultural education isn't existent. And so maybe they gave me that idea is like, well, wow, like that's what you and I are doing. And, you know, are there other things that we could do better to help like supplement that and to get that education out to people because it doesn't exist, right? Yeah, I mean, the agricultural classes really are depending on where your school is like Caledonia where I live is more of a farm like there's a lot of farms in this area so therefore there's a FFA program which is a farming support program and there's a agriculture class but if you go Grand Rapids nobody's signing up to teach agriculture to kids in class like that that, that's, that just doesn't happen um, not even teaching culinary like all yeah, of those exactly classes. culinary too yes I mean, all those are like ancillary things, right? Where people either go to like a community college to learn or a culinary program, or if they're lucky, they have a family that cares about teaching them about that. Otherwise, those two areas go unnoticed and uncared for through an entire lifespan. Um, and so I just, yeah, I, I don't know why we forego the one thing that we all care to to, to include in our days. Like food is something that we all focus our time on like amongst uh, any other thing that you can think about spending your time on so I just I don't know why we discount that <laughs> so it, yeah it's a, it may be a good question to for us to continue to explore and think more deeply on right um we have that opportunity here and uh but um no I I I love yeah what he shared was great and uh yeah, I wasn't, I, was, I wasn't quite sure. I, I, I felt bad that I wasn't in the kitchen. And so I hope it was okay that I shared something from, from the course. And I know we've done that recipe in the past, but. Hey, it was a special episode. So everything about it felt different. And I think it was a good, I think it was a good one, man. Yeah. And it, it gave some visibility to some stuff that people can connect with you on too, you know? Yeah. So um, that was good. Cool, man. Well, I don't want to take your time. I know you got a busy, busy stuff happening, but um, I do have my, uh, I talked to my buddy about at the CrossFit gym. He's going to book something here in the next day or two. So okay. we'll get him going. Um, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really excited to keep moving this forward. And uh, if there's anything I can do, Troy, as well, like to, um, you know, kind of continue to, you know, if there's anything I can help take off your plate as you sort of transition, um, please just communicate with me and I'll do the best that I possibly can. So. Oh, I appreciate that, man. I, this, 
this relationship and the farm show and everything is is really enjoyable for me. Um, so I'm loving everything that we're doing and I'm loving watching it grow. I think really the decisions I need to make come on all the other ancillary things that I choose to say yes to. <laughs> so, um, and then like, you know, the, I love think deeply and, but I just like, I hear Brian say, this is where you, this is where you are. And now you got to go another few hours to get to where you want to be. And sometimes I'm just like, holy shit, where do I find those few hours at? Like I could barely find these few hours. So, um, but I care about it, you know, so it's hard. It's like a contrast, but it's just, yeah, I'll get there. Well, and I would, I, you know, I, I know Brian said, you know, I think it's not necessarily like him asking you, Troy, to give it three more hours. I think what he's saying is that like, even when, when we think it's done, like, can you come back to it a little bit later? And, uh, you know, like, you know, for whatever time that you do have available, Troy, like you, yeah, you know, like it's, I don't think by any means is Brian saying, Troy, you need to spend three more hours here on this post, you know, but I think even for me, it's just, I think what he's trying to really do, at least for how I'm hearing this, is just like, to kind of to keep challenging it, you know, challenge what is written. Yes. No, that's good. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it will take three hours, but it's like, it's, you know, as we kind of continue to develop the skill, the mastery around it, it won't be as long. Yeah. Totally get it. Yeah. I think it's, it's probably more just in line with the time that I have now, right? With the family <laughs> dynamics is what makes it difficult. But yeah. once you get to a place, um, yeah. But yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, thanks for setting this up too. I oh yeah, my pleasure. And yeah. and just so um, what I can do also here with uh, with Joel here is uh, I'll have my VA um, run through, comb through it. She pulls selects. I don't know if you got a chance to see what. Uh, once you get a chance, I did uh, share something in our shared folder on on Google oh. Drive of Michael's uh, from the other day. Oh. So it would be fun Ooh. to get. Yeah, no, something exactly. we can share with him and, you know, yep. just for social media purposes too, so. Yeah, see, see, um, what's, what's your VA's name again? Christine. Christine. See if, yeah, see if Christine wouldn't mind putting something short together for this, this interview and I'll hold off on um, fully like publishing it and promoting it or anything until we get that and then we can use that as. A yeah, project. oh, great idea. Yeah, I'll have her do like a a minute segment or something, and then we can have a two or three minute segment as well. So perfect. Sweet. Cool, man. All right. Let's All right. See Take care, brother. Yep. See ya.